Okay, Doc. I recently ran my first cycle for competition, which included test and anthate, uh, 500 milligrams weekly, then switched to test propionate 100 milligrams every other day. Also, trenbolone, I'm not sure if that's anthate or uh, acetate, 400 milligrams, equipoise 500 milligrams, and Winstraw 25 milligrams daily oral pill. All reasonable small dose ran for 18 weeks. Last four were only test and anthate in equipoise. During cycle had minimal sides that I could notice due to diet for show. Well, due partly to poor coaching slash personal research, I never ran any anti-estrogen during or after and attempted to run HCG from last injection at 500 IU daily till I used the entire 10,000 IU kit. Okay, well, I failed to refrigerate the kit after mixing, and so after about two weeks and crazy happenings, mentally and physically, I found I had pretty much cycled off 100% cold turkey. After six to eight weeks now of balancing out hormonally, I actually never had any real aromatase issues or gyno, but immediately following the show and for about four to five weeks, I had edema issues in my legs with water pockets inside inner thighs. Is that related to cycling off? I mainly just lost a lot of size and get super soft muscle wise or got super soft muscle wise. But I have this whole time developed painful large uh, ache or acne, I can't tell because it's spelled A-C-H-N-E, across okay. and down my spine on back and chest. Any advice on how to combat, uh, combat the extreme? Acne, I'm assuming, acne, and yeah. why I had no real aromatase issues. And what can I do to ensure my body is functioning correctly again, hormone-wise? I'm very novice to all these issues and could seriously use the help and peace of mind and to try to remain as healthy as possible after making such a huge, mis a huge mistake. Thanks for any help in advance. Love the videos. Keep them coming, Dave. <laughs> so, boy, this was a long question, obviously, and a lot of issues. Um, you know, all reasonable small dose, that, that reference, I, I would not necessarily agree with at all. This is a large amount of <laughs> testosterone or, you know, a testosterone analog, obviously. Um, you know, we do have studies, I might have mentioned it in prior videos, and they're not a whole lot, obviously, either. Uh, but we have some in English, maybe a half dozen or so, so that show that 600 milligrams a week of testosterone, not an a anabolic steroid, but testosterone, um, as long as you keep the, the side effects, namely or mainly estrogen under control, uh, can be used and you can actually be bigger, stronger, faster without really risking your health. I'm not promoting that, but I'm just saying that is about as far as I think anyone should ever stretch it. And I've said that over and over again uh, to guys that, you know, take it upon themselves to, to do this without, you know, guidance of a physician or, you know, whatever. Um, this is not a small dose, and a lot of these you're going to have trouble with um, in the androgenic department, uh, Trenbolone is, is very androgenic, uh, Winstrol is a DHT derivative, Equipoise is very androgenic, um, so... And that's I, for like 18 weeks too. Yeah, that's a long time. Yeah. And, and, and by the way, I don't know how old this, this person is, but one thing for sure that we know about using these things and, and uh, preserving endogenous function is you're better off using a higher dose for a short period than uh, even a small dose for a long period. In other words, chronicity of use is the issue that shuts down your endogenous production of testosterone. So um, I don't know why I think this is probably someone who's young, maybe not, but uh, you know, aside from the obvious things we talked about before, um, you know, yeah, this, this, is, this is an awfully high dose, and that is a long time here, 18 weeks, uh, relatively speaking. Um, not doing an anti-estrogen, as he puts it, well, yeah, that's, that's crazy. I don't know how you can look good on stage without using an anti-estrogen, uh, something to block the, you're, you're going to hold water if your estrogen goes uh, high, and, 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 and it had to have gone high in this case. Uh, what I, I do want to mention here, though, is, uh, you know, hopefully there's at least one pearl out of all the, the, the jibber-jabber I give for the, the answers to the questions. 
it, you know, the HCG, the post cycle therapy, this is a, this is a this is a common uh, mistake that people make. Remember that when even with a um, a regular replacement therapy dose, I, I always note that people at about three weeks post discontinuation of the, the therapy will bottom out. They'll feel horrible, even though they may their their testosterone may dive you know, down to even below uh, normal, not just low, but below normal, um, after say 10 to 14 days after they stop because they've suppressed the endogenous production, whatever it was. Again, if it's a TRT patient or a replacement therapy patient, you know, it was low to begin with. So, but it'll be even lower for a while. But for some reason, people don't really feel really crappy until about the third week. When you're doing this much, uh, anabolic, you know, supplementation, you've got half-lives that you're dealing with and you've got a quantity that you're dealing with, you're still going to show up high if this is true, in my estimation, at three weeks. You haven't gone off yet. You stopped injecting yourself, but your levels are still going to be high. So to throw in um, 10 IUs, sorry, 10,000 IUs of HCG during that time period really isn't going to do much for you. Rather than critique this, let me just flip the script, as they say, and, and, and say what I think is more ideal, which is um, I treat, you know, for, for whatever reason, usually it's fertility. Someone says, hey, you know, my wife and I want to get pregnant now. Um, and, and so, you know, because I've had low T and then gotten on replacement therapy, uh, we found out, uh, you know, I'm infertile, so I, I got to get off this stuff and get fertile and then get back on. So... We want to do this as effectively and efficiently, quickly as possible. I tell uh, you know these couples that the testicles are kind of like I refer to them like diesel engines. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's hard to get them up and running again when they've been shut down. Whereas the pituitary acts like a gas engine, man, it turns on right away. So if you're going to be coming off of a, you know call it a cycle or coming off TRT. You want to start simulating the testicles long before you discontinue your therapy. The problem with this gentleman is the timing is horrendous. Okay, there was really no effect from that 10,000 IU. Um, well, he says because he left it out, and so. But even if it had been, you know, uh, fully effective, uh, uh, you know, full strength um, uh, HCG, it wouldn't have done much for him. I recommend you that, you that if you're going to get off TRT, you start at least six weeks before you want to discontinue with HCG to make sure those testicles, the light cells specifically, have been reminded, if you will, you know, that hey, you're going to be needed here. Wake up, um, and so that when the level of testosterone or the anabolic steroid finally drops low enough, and the body says, hey, we got to create some of our own, the pituitary kicks on right away, and there won't be a long delay before the the testicles kick in okay so that's one mistake a lot of guys make that you know they they do their last shot and then the next day start acg for three weeks you are going to get maybe a little bit of benefit for what i said just about trying to get the the testicles the diesel engines kick started early but you know that's that's probably not going to do much of all now if you're talking about the speed to get yourself uh your testicles back up and running again yeah, your, your body's going to throw a fit and your pituitary is going to release a whole bunch of luteinizing hormone in its panic mode to say, hey, let's get going. But again, that cold turkey, not only is it not comfortable, if the testicles have shut down significantly, you're still going to have a lag. So again, no matter what, it's better to use the HCG uh, while you're still doing your TRT um, uh, in advance of getting off of it uh, for, I, again, I... I use six weeks just because clinically I see people have you know much better transition periods with that uh, before you discontinue. Are so, the dosage correct that he's using? Um, you know, six weeks out. I used to use 250 IU every other day, okay. but because you got to jab yourself every other day, and because um, ACG there, there there aren't risks really associated with HCG. It's just an analog of, of, of luteinizing hormone. It does also tend to act like uh, thyroid-releasing hormone. Uh, 
so again, though, you're not really, you're not taking a, a big risk. So I, I, I say go to 500 IU, make sure that the, every other day, and make sure the testicles are up and running. Uh, it's generally accepted that as long as you don't go above 500 IU every day, you're not going to desensitize the lytic cells to HCG. So you're, you're, you're pretty, pretty safe with that dose. And you're getting to uh, the, the, the goal, which is to get off of the testosterone for whatever your reasons are and, and make the transition smooth. Now, with everything I said and looking at his timeline here, yeah, no wonder he's having issues because, you know, he never took an aromatase inhibitor of any kind. Um, and and uh, so he's going to have edema issues uh, just for that reason alone. He's also, uh, you know, and this is what I hallucinate, you know, that he didn't mention. Once you go off, you're probably not getting your, your usual daily dose of exercise. So you're not moving the lymph. You're not moving that excess fluid around. So it might be pooling. I mean, there's so many, who knows why, why he's got this excess, excess edema. But um, we can certainly guess why. The hormones are bouncing all over the place because he went off cold turkey um, and because he went on such a high dose. So, uh, you know, afterwards you're, you're doing this uh, until you level off. And of course, uh, we know that the acne is a result of the um, testosterone anyway, with testosterone replacement therapy being converted to dihydrotestosterone. In this case, as I mentioned, the, the trenbolone, the equipoise, and the Winstrol can all, and Winstrol, despite popular belief, can cause acne. You know, a lot of the, the, the lady uh, uh, track athletes were using Winstrol thinking that, oh, it's, it's, it's harmless. Uh, not the case. Uh, harmless in terms of, you know, oh, it's very clean, it's just yeah. anabolic and not going to give me any, ang any androgenic side effects. But um, uh, my point being that that could easily explain the acne. And just because it took a long time for it to kick in, man, I've seen some very interesting cases where uh, a year and a half into replacement therapy in a 56-year-old male, you started losing hair. Wow. Okay, so you figure, okay, you're already on this. Your body's gotten used to it. And the only explanation we, we came up with is a shock to the system. We being not just me and the patient, but, you know, we got referred. We, we went to uh, dermatologists and, and hair specialists, and everyone said the same thing. Look, we know DHT is the protagonist in acne and hair loss, especially, you know, male pattern baldness. Mm -hmm. Why this is happening, the only thing we could come up with is just... The, the body just felt like it was being shocked. So that's a year and a half into, in this case, wow. and I've had more than one. It's probably a handful um, that it, that this has happened to where we just figured, okay, the body just, you know, looked at it as, wow, this is too much. Yeah. Um, I know that doesn't sound intuitively reasonable, but where else are you getting the acne from? Yeah. Okay, it's got to be from the, the, the uh, fairly androgenic cycle you were on or your own production, which is going up and down. Yeah. Um, and we may not have a complete handle on, on all the sources of acne because I've, I've definitely had patients tell me that when they adjust their anastrozole dose, acne will come and go. Now, of course, you've got some, um, some synergy there because testosterone is a substrate from which estrogen is made and from which DHT is made. So if you jigger one, you might be affecting the other. So I'm not postulating any new theories. I'm just saying that, you know, it, it all has to do with balance. And clearly this, 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 this guy, um, unfortunately, got way out of balance. What I would suggest at this point uh, to help is uh, get labs drawn. Let's see what your levels are of, yeah. of estradiol, testosterone, free and total, and dihydrotestosterone. Uh, you can get on something that will stop the formation of dihydrotestosterone called finasteride. You could even go to dutasteride, which is more expensive, but 100 to 300 times more powerful, depending on if we're talking about the hair follicles or the, the prostate, okay? Um, and, of course, if the estrogen is out of control, uh, we can bring it back down to reduce the, uh, the edema, presumably from the excess estrogen, and also to get your own body functioning again, meaning... You know, if estrogen is too high or testosterone is too high, if either one of those is high, the pituitary is not going to send a signal to tell the testicles to start producing more. So get a beat on everything, make the appropriate adjustments, and that will start to balance out the hormones. Um, uh, 
Uh, yeah, I, I agree uh, not to not to chime in and, and, and you know, pour salt in the wound. But yeah, this was kind of a mistake. Um, and uh, hopefully, uh, uh, I, I've, well, let me just say this. It will normalize. I've never found a case where the physiology doesn't restore itself unless this is a 15-year-old that did this. You know, while he was still hardwiring, or now it's really more soft wiring, we realize, but, you know, hardwiring the HPA access. But this, if this is a 30-year-old, you know, you're, you're going to go back to, to normal. I, I, I've never seen a case that it didn't happen that way. It's just, it's yeah, there'll, there'll be some, yeah, some fluctuations. I think I answered everything on that one. Right? Yeah. Thank you, Doc. Okay, Doc. So another question is, uh, Dave, I have a, <clears throat> excuse me, I have a question for the Doc. I've been on TRT for approximately two years now. Since I started, I have experienced anxiety and panic attacks. Also, my heart rate and my BP have been elevated. Example, blood pressure 144 over 86, pulse 98. I'm 42 years old and never had BP issues or anxiety before. I've had my estrogen and all the standard hormones checked and all were normal. I take an astrazole one milligram per week. Even had my thyroid checked, any suggestions? Um, boy, this is an interesting one because there are a few uh, loaded parts to this question. And what I mean by that is, um, one of the things he answered up front is, I asked people if you've ever had anxiety issues prior to getting on replacement therapy because a lot of times they'll say, oh yeah, when I was in my 20s, I, I kind of had this, but I outgrew it. So with TRT, what you're doing is... In all cases, you're just giving yourself more energy to be whomever you are. So yeah, you can bring back those feelings of anxiety you had when you were 20. Now that you're plugging yourself back in, so to speak, you, feel you know, like you're with more testosterone. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so that's interesting because that's not the problem here. Uh, little known fact is, though, that um, when you use replacement therapy, your body will make more thyroid hormone typically, and oftentimes you can kill two birds with one stone. If someone's a little low or below normal thyroid. Uh, you can get them on TRT, obviously if it's appropriate, but then the test, the uh, excuse me, thyroid will pump up too, and you don't have to worry about it. So unless someone's really, really low uh, in thyroid, I won't start them on thyroid, assuming they need testosterone. We'll start with that first, and then wait 90 days and see where where do we stand. Because if you're you thyroid, your your body will see the increased thyroid, but keep it bound up and say thanks, but no thanks. But if you're hypothyroid, you'll 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 take advantage of it. So. Unfortunately, he says here, even had my thyroid checked, that doesn't mean anything to me. And this is why, you know, these are not, all these videos are not meant to diagnose, treat, they're just informational. Like, hopefully we still have the disclaimer off every time. I'd be in India. But, <laughs> but this is why you should go to a physician because, um, you know, the reference interval, and I know I've been on my soapbox more than once on these uh, videos before about, you know, the reference interval and natural, normal, whatever, you know, it's natural, normal, you get sick and die one day, Who? so who cares? I understand back in the day, you know, in early medicine, someone felt ill, you wanted to get them back to this idea of normal, well, but really we're advanced enough now where certainly we're appropriate, where we've got plenty of information, we should be talking about optimum. So when he says, even had my thyroid checked, that doesn't mean too much to me. If it's, say, his T3, the active form, free, free T3, uh, triiodothyronine is 3.5, that may be enough for him, uh, in this case, to feel anxious, uh, or 3.9 or 4.2. I mean, you know, you, go, you start going to 4.5 is, uh, is usually the normal reference, but again, who cares? Mm -hmm. If you go back and look, for example, just to stay within the guidelines of what I'm suggesting, and Heretofore, his T3 has never been above 2.9, and now he's at 3.5. Okay, well, now we have an explanation. Excess thyroid can cause anxiety, as he figured out, mm -hmm. and check, but check doesn't give me enough information. So let's see, you know, in co combination with his TSH and some other clinical uh, uh, factors as well, if maybe the problem is with the thyroid. Second of all, Nasrazole once a week, and, and I get this a lot because I'm – considered fairly aggressive when it comes to keeping estrogen low. I'd rather over suppress it than under suppress it when I get someone first started on replacement therapy because of all the negative side effects associated with uh, too much estrogen. And in the short term, typically, uh, I don't see any uh, effects from uh, over suppressing estrogen. Uh, 
and 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 so without getting into more detail, one milligram a week is, seems pretty light to me. I start people off on a what I call a prophylactic dose of anastrozole, one milligram every other day with the standard one cc of testosterone sipionate per week. Uh, excess estrogen can not only cause water weight gain, fat gain, but you know moodiness, irascibility, anxiety, okay, mm -hmm. Uh, and, and panic attacks is somewhat loosely uh, bandied about, but you know could could be responsible for all this. So I would want to go back and check, and I, I I'm, and I'm putting my money on that, uh, given that the thyroid is is within range, because the excess BP uh, could be from uh, the excess water weight. You know, mm. the third space water can contribute to the That's pressure right. on the cuff. Um, as well as in, any uh, intravascular water, obviously. Pulse rate, that one, uh, you know, tachycardia is defined as 100 beats per minute or more. He's at 98. Again, I'd need more information. Um, are you doing your cardio? Is this normal for you? Or would, you know, 88 be your normal resting heart rate? Uh, is this all up here? Uh, when you go to sleep, is it does it drop down to 60 because you really are in good shape and this is all going back to the thyroid or, you know, some psychological issues, which apparently he didn't have before. But, you know, again, I, I don't mean to give a Byzantine or certainly a, a not useful answer, but there are more areas we got to get our, our uh, arms around here before you can make a decision. But definitely, uh, this is not normal. Um, I would first step uh, consider increasing your anastrozole. Uh, obviously, you can first step is go to a physician and get it of done course. under the guidance. But assuming I'm the physician, I would my first guess would be uh, to increase the amount of anastrozole and see if some of these symptoms don't go away. Um, and that would be a clinical move. Obviously, we can use the labs and say, hey, before you touch anything, let's get a beat on your estradiol levels, your thyroid levels, and let's see. You know, even amongst the the profession, you've got the standard. Uh, 0.45 to 4.5, and I was referring to TSH earlier, not T3, but uh, that's um, for part of the conversation. But that's the, again, uh, standard normal reference interval. But the Endocrine Society, which tends to specialize more in endocrinology than, you, you know, your typical GP, uh, will look at 2.5 as the, as the top of the range rather than 4.5 and treat in other words, if you have a TSH of 2.5 or above, and you have symptoms of low thyroid, you're cold all the time, you have dry hair and dry skin. So, you know, I call it paint by numbers. Um, and that's to what I'm referring when I say, you know, I, I even had my thyroid checked. I don't know what that means and what, the, you know, how the GP was interpreting, or not only say GP, but the, the, the other doctor was interpreting any of this stuff. So mm -hmm. I don't mean to ramble, but yeah, I, I would, I would uh, pursue this because, yeah, you shouldn't necessarily have uh, panic and, attacks and or, because uh, yeah. those usually come on early in life. Either you're, you're sort of preset for those and you'll know you have them really from childhood or the latest would be late teens, early 20s typically. And then you know you got it. You know it's in your genes or not. So if it came on with his testosterone, um, I'd be suspect there's, it's affecting something else. Something else is not being done properly with the TRT. Good. Thanks, Doc. Okay, Doc. Next question. Dave, could you ask the doc about his thoughts on teranobol as a standalone compound for muscle gain, and is it truly incapable of aromatizing, having a chemical structure of? I'm not even going to try and pronounce the generic. Thank you in advance. Please keep the episodes coming very educational. My favorite episodes on your channel. <laughs> nice. Again, I should throw in there. Uh, this has all been Dave's <laughs> idea, guys. So uh, <laughs> I take no credit. Uh, it was his brainchild. Um, Tyrannobol is is, uh, is is Dianabol, but watered down, if you will. And I I, I don't mean that in any uh, you know pejorative sense toward Tyrannobol, but Tyrannobol. Uh, I believe was invented because they wanted to get the same effect of Dianabol, which has been around forever. Uh, I knew guys who I won't mention their name, but be, you know, before steroids were banned in the '76 Olympics, that you know verified the old stories about you know a handful of Dianabol for breakfast, and uh, some of these guys set uh, uh, world records and won gold medals back in the day. Um, 
again, I don't want to be disrespectful to them because they can tell you if they did or not. But um, actually, one of them, uh, uh, you know, talks about it uh, before he uh, died. But anyway, dianabol, the problem is it can convert into estrogen. Teranabol, because of the substitution on uh, one of the carbons, I think it's the carbon four, uh, you have the, the, uh, the, uh, the inability to convert or to be aromatized. So um, it's my understanding that it will not aromatize, but it doesn't have the same effect as Dianabol in terms of muscle gains. Now, you know, everybody's different. So, and, and people think I'm dodging the question perhaps, but that's the great thing about medicine. It's not like business where, you know, you just deal with that area underneath the Gaussian curve. I, I use the example all the time in my practice. you got people that can take um, uh, a, a, an amphetamine Adderall and go to sleep. Wow. That's the rarity, you know, but they have ADHD. So, uh, yes. you know, they're, they're structured, they're wired differently. Whereas most people would be cleaning the house for two days up all night, you know, mm -hmm. so depending on the dose, uh, it, it's very different with medicine. And so when I, you know, I'm generalizing and just please accept that I am generalizing and that's just based upon my experience, uh, over the years talking with people about this and getting their feedback I typically don't recommend anybody, um, well, as a doctor, I have to recommend that people use what is appropriate for the condition and not talk about, okay, this is better for muscle building. But as a general rule, uh, when you're dealing with, with muscle building alone, um, for as long as I can remember, people have always stacked and, and more importantly, always use testosterone as a base. So in my experience, people who are using anabolics to, whether it's to be bigger or stronger or faster, um, use testosterone as a base, not a steroid alone. So teranobol would probably be best used. And you know, the, the whole thing about stacking is mixing and matching things that have uh, it's almost like we mix and match them according to side effect profile, you know. Mm. Um, I'm not a big fan of anyone taking uh, a, a steroid that's not contraband in this country. It is legal to prescribe for certain issues, um, uh, pernicious anemia being one of them, but Anadrol. Anadrol is one of those that makes guys tend to be, you know, almost homicidal. And I argue, well, why do you need to do that when you can just have a couple of espressos to get pumped up for workout, you know, and again, I'm not trying to be uh, disrespectful or <clears throat> toward anybody who's taken them, but you know, there's so many side effects that come with Anadrol. It's, it's one of those things where is the juice worth the squeeze? Mm -hmm. um, and how am I going off on this tangent? I, I, I don't know, but Tyranobol uh, alone, um, I don't know of too many people who have ever done it alone, again, normally with a base of, of testosterone. And, uh, getting back to what I was saying about combinations, it's been my experience to see people always combining something that's very anabolic with something that might tend to be more androgenic. Um, and that's what I was referring to with the anadrol. I, I, I get it. You get the um, anabolism and you also get the aggressive nature of the androgenic uh, uh, steroid. Uh, but again, why not just throw in some espresso and then you don't have to worry about hair growing on your back or zits and stuff like that is my point. That's all. Right. Uh, Tyranobol is very mild when it comes to side effects all the way around, to answer the question more directly. So, yeah, it doesn't convert to estrogen. doesn't tend to have the androgenic side effects like, well, certainly like the anabol would be stronger in the androgenic side effects too, or certainly like some of those like uh, anadrol. So, um more than likely, you might want to combine that with something else for the reasons I mentioned, but uh, it's, it's not a, in terms of uh, side effects and side effect profiles, it's not a, I don't want to say dangerous one, but it's, it's not a risky one like some of the others. Gotcha. Thank you, Doc. Thank you, Doc.